you know, you know some of Chasing Amy, you know some of Mall Rats on very low budget. He did very big things. And so, Kevin, thank you for making the time for me today. Uh, among your early work, what is it that you look at and say that was the most fulfilling or that was the most fun I had? Those are two different questions. True. Uh, fulfilling um, was probably Clerks because it just keeps paying dividends even today. We just wrapped Clerks 3 and Clerks 3 is about Randall, the guy from the video store, uh, deciding at age 50 after a massive heart attack that he has nothing to leave behind. So he wants, after years of watching movies, he wants to make a movie himself. So they wind up making Clerks, essentially, a black and white movie about working at the convenience store. So Clerks, probably the most fulfilling because it still, to this day, pays the bills in some ways. I don't think not a day has gone by since 1993 that I haven't said the word Clerks out loud in some conversation or something like that. So that's definitely the, the one that's most fulfilling. In terms of most fun, um, I remember Strike Back was fun to make just because it was me and Jason every day and then the cast would change. Like it was so full of cameos and day players that you never got a chance to grow sick of anybody, you never saw anybody's bad side. But to get there, we had to get Jason clean. So that wasn't, that part wasn't fun. Um, I, let me see, I mean, they're all fun, don't get me wrong. None of them are work, Dan. They're all like, you'd rather do this than any job in the world because the job is not visionary or anything like that. The job is literally to answer questions. That's what a director does. A lot of people think they compose shots. No, the director of photography does that, the cinematographer. A director's job is to stand on set and answer every question that everybody has. And everybody's full of questions because... Nobody knows what the movie looks like except the one person that they nominally put in charge. So everybody comes to that person to be like, you got to tell me like what it looks like, what, what's in your head. So you're, as long as you can answer questions, you can direct a motion picture. It's that simple. Um, so they're all easy and all fun because like I worked, the last real job I had was working at the convenience store, working at Quick Stop. And, you know, whenever you work for somebody else, that feels like work. If, you know, if you're, if somebody's like, Hey, you got to be here at such and such a time and do such and such a thing. You tend to be like, Oh man, I work for some AH, like somebody's over me and stuff. And we all dream about being our own bosses. At least I did and stuff. That's why I pursued film. So it's all fun because it's all make pretend you get to make pretend for a living. And yes, there are millions of dollars at risk, but it ain't like Chris Nolan millions of dollars, like 200 million, you know, like we just made uh Clerks 2 for what, 8 million or something like that? Clerks 3 for 8 million, which is way more than we made the first one for. The first one we made for 27575 bucks. Inflation at the end of the day. Anytime you're going to make a movie with a number in the title, expect to pay more because that means that something was successful enough that somebody's like, let's do it again. And generally when folks say, let's do it again, they do it for the money. Not me. I just wanted to play with my toys. After I had a heart attack like three years ago, almost died three and a half years ago, you know, I come out of it going like, I just want to play with my old toys. I want to play with Jane, Silent Bob, Dante and Randall. So for me, it's been therapeutic. I get something out of it. Don't get me wrong, but it ain't money. Like the pursuit of money has never been part of my matrix. Otherwise I wouldn't make Kevin Smith movies, man. You don't make these types of movies to get rich. You do them because you want to make pretend for a living. You want to make pretend right up until the day you go toes up out of this world because you figured out at an early age, watching your father work for the United States Postal Service that there is no great job, you know, other than the one where you answer to nobody, and except in my case, the audience. I got one boss, it's the audience. So every time I meet somebody who's like, I love your stuff, that's why I got time for them because I'm like, this is the only boss I have in the world, man. If I piss this person off, I, you know, maybe I get fired from that person and stuff. And when you work for somebody else and the boss meets you or comes over and talks to you, you always turn on the brave face and you're super nice. Same thing for the audience. It's the only technical, technically the only boss I have. And then, of course, my wife, naturally. So long story short, Dan, most fun I ever had making a movie might have been Clerks 2. 
Um, it, it was absolute, absolutely glorious. So fun, so reinvigorating. I called, I called it for years the last good time. Um, because then Zach and Miri happened after that, and that was that was different. That was cold. And then cop out happened soon after, and that was like a weird bad experience and stuff. But uh, things got better after that. But Clerks Two was such a great experience that I pursued Clerks Three for the last seven years because I was like, I got to get back to that. That was magic. What a great time. I want to tell a Dante and Randall story because they're my 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 uh, I don't know my familiars, right? Like. Clerks was a story about what I felt like it was like to be in my 20s. Clerks 2 was like what I felt like it was like to be in my 30s. Clerks 3 is midlife to the grave. It's kind of what it's about and stuff. So though my characters and I have grown up together the way Michael Apted made a series of documentaries called 7 Up, 14 Up, 21 Up, followed these kids throughout their lives. Um, same way Richard Linklater has done the Before Sunrise series and went around with the two same characters and you got to watch them grow. Dante and Randall, go figure, wound up being my guys where I could chart not just my journey through life, but their journey through life. You know, I'm not stupid. They're fictional characters. I get it played brilliantly by Brian O'Halloran and Jeff Anderson. But you got to understand, Dante and Randall are responsible for everything I have, everything you see here. I live in a museum, a huge house that's a shrine to myself and all the dopey things I've ever done solely because of Dante and Randall. Because if they don't work, Clerks don't work, nobody sees it, and I never get another chance. So I love Dante and Randall so much, and I loved hanging out with them again on Clerks 2 that I spent nearly a decade trying to make Clerks 3 happen, and we finally made it happen just recently and stuff. And I'll tell you, it was everything that I hoped it would be. Now, I should then, by virtue of the fact, say that since it's the most recent and since it was everything I thought it would be, that it, it was the most fun. But I, I, it was fun. Was it the most fun? Now you got me. You got me on my heels here, Dan. I have. Think. Well, I have a lot. See, I have a lot of follow up questions just on what you said here. Like, what is in your? <laughs> okay. What one weird thing is in your house among all your collectibles? Because you're. I mean, you're a comic book dork. You are a oversized kid. I imagine your wife finds that both amusing and very frustrating. Uh, what in your home would you like trot out as like this is my most valuable museum piece? So weird. I don't have one. I'm not like a real possessions guy. I, my house is loaded with crap. I'm less a possessions guy, Dan, more of a hoarder. Um, if, you know, I don't know if they do that show anymore, but they'd be welcome to come here and they'd be, you know, it's not newspapers. It's newspapers full of articles about Kevin Smith and Jane Silent Bob and stuff like that. Um, I, I do tend to save everything, which is very useful. Like in a world where we just made Clerks 3, we had to replicate the past. I still had a lot of the past on hand and stuff. But I would say, honestly, like of everything we got in the house, the thing that to me has the most value. Um, I mean, we got this gigantic painting of the kid, man. It's like massive of the our kid Harley when she was about three years old. And when you walk in the door, it's bigger than you and me. It's tall as hell. We got tall ceilings in the in the, when you first come into the house. What I call uh, the the front porch, they call the foyer. Um, we've got like a big wall and there's this huge looming painting of Harley, big as life, like a billboard you'd find on the side of the road of the kid when she was three. And it's not like we fetishize the kid. We only got one and we absolutely adore her and stuff. But it was done at a time where like I had money to spend and I was a big art fan and, and an artist myself. So I was like, oh my God, let's get this heirloom piece. And then one day we get to give it to the kid. The kid refuses to own it. She hates it. It's been across from her room every day of her life. Uh, it embarrasses her when people come in the house because it's like a giant portrait of her when she was a kid. Um, so I think we're stuck with it forever. And I'm okay with that because it captures a real moment in time. It was painted by Gottfried Helnwein, who's a wonderful painter. He does these gigantic panels of children's faces and whatnot. His, his work looks like photograph but it's painted. You get in close to this big picture of Harley, you think it's a photograph, but then you see the brush strokes. It's pretty astounding. So I, I guess in terms of a thing I own that I paid for, that painting of Harley, like whenever I think about earthquakes, because we live in California, or house fire or something, the first thing I think about is like, we once we get the humans out and the pets, we would have to go back to get that portrait, man. Like letting it burn would be some sort of sin as an art fan but mm -hmm. i guess that would be it I, I should have an answer like i got a stormtrooper helmet or original 
lightsaber and stuff. I mean, in terms of here in the house, most of the things that are precious to me, like from the movies, all the props, they're at Jay and Silent Bob's Secret Stash, my comic book store in Red Bank, New Jersey, so people could enjoy them. Here in the house, it's mostly photos. Jennifer, my wife, arranged the house early on so that as you walk through it, is a series of family walls. So there's, here in my office is definitely about the stuff I've done. Outside of my office, it's more about the, the family and the stuff that we've done. You'd be looking hard to find a clerk's anything out there. Growing up, you liked comic books more than movies? The same? Probably the same. I always went for the soft existence, man. When I was a kid, like sports were what uh, pop culture is today. You know, sports were a dominant culture outside the mainstream culture, so much so that it became the mainstream culture in many cases. And so you know, sports didn't interest me. I was a soft, uh, fat kid. Uh, I loved TV. I loved going to the movies. I loved comic books. All of that, anything that was like, you know, oh, this is for kids or this is a distraction. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll take that distraction. I was raised Catholic. So early on, I was given a sense of my own mortality and that like if I didn't watch it, I'd wind up burning forever in hell. So for me, I lean toward morality tales. You know, the Bible's got a bunch of good ones, but like, you know, Marvel and DC's got way better ones and they're colorful characters dressed in great costumes and stuff. So, you know, and, and people punch people in the face. That don't happen in the Bible, and if, you know, except Goliath and and, and and David, and that wasn't a punch so much as a slingshot. So if you're into good versus bad, but you also like colorful costumes and physical altercations where, you know, uh, sometimes good's against the ropes, but good will always triumph, then absolutely comic books as a, as a Catholic kid were preferable to, to simple Bible stories. Same effect, morality tales, be good rather than bad and stuff, stay away from evil and whatnot. So I like that. I like church. I was an altar boy. I like, you know, I thought for years when I was a kid that I wanted to be a priest. Um, but then I realized I just like being on stage and wearing a costume. And then that lent more toward like theater and movies and stuff like that. And then later on after the movies, because like at an early age, when they put you out there to talk about the flicks, um, you, you know, you have to stand there and kind of answer for the movie you made or whatnot. I didn't try to answer seriously because I'm no filmmaker. I'm still not after all this time. So I tried to answer amusingly, like my hero, George Carlin. I put a mic in my hand. I was like, I better try to be funny. So I wouldn't tell him how we made the film as much as like, uh, this is how we got the cat to come in and take a poop on cue in that one scene. It's a real funny story and stuff. So based on that, I was always kind of put out there and uh, singing for my supper, so to speak. And, you know, I got to kind of stand in front of the movie and then apart from the movie as well. So there's this whole other life I got that has nothing to do with making films where I just stand around and talk, which has been a wonderful backdoor comic experience, which sounds way sexier than, than I mean it. Um, but it led to like podcasting. It led to me doing a bunch of other things other than, than just the movies. And so uh, for me here in the house, it's, it's not just like, I can't point to one thing. I can point to so many things. There's a microphone here that we've been recording Smodcast and Fat Man Beyond on for, I don't know, the last like 10 years. I've been doing podcasting for, I think, going on 13, 14 years now. We were kind of early into it and whatnot. So things all around here is I, I don't have a precious bong to point to or something like that. And I wish I had some movie props, but I, I like to put those on display for the people to see that sort of thing. Here in the house, it's more about pictures. If stuff. you had to rank if you had to rank for me sort of odd experiences because you, you don't think of yourself as a filmmaker and you dork out on things, George Carlin in dogma or Stan Lee, uh, having them in your movies, like where would you rank these, these experiences where you're like, how is this happening to me? Uh, wish fulfillment. I, I've seen a lot of people conduct their careers in a much different way. Like, you know, a lot of people in my line of work chase Oscar gold and, and, you know, uh, career that gets better as they go along and stuff. I got my foot in the door with like this magic wish fulfillment motion picture that I put on my own credit cards, clerks, opening the door to a whole different world to me. And I never could take it that seriously because I'm not good at the job. You ask any critic, they'll tell you and stuff. I make Kevin Smith movies, very specific art form. You know, if you give me another movie to make, believe me, I dropped the ball, case in point, cop out. But like Kevin Smith movie, you can trust me to make. And the good news is ain't nobody out there trying to make one of those except Kevin Smith. 
So for me, I've always kind of leaned more le less toward like what will be good for my career and more like what would I just love to do, man? Like, you know, and I, I don't go for like, let me work people like puppets or, or, or be a dick. I always went for stuff like, oh my God, wouldn't it be great to hang out with Stan Lee? Like I heard him talk at so many Comic-Cons and whatnot, but to have him in the movie, like I have a fictional character in the movie uh, that's like the voice of comic books and stuff. Uh, a guy I made up. And then, uh, who was it? Uh, Jim Jacks, the producer on Mallrats, was like, uh, well, who's this character supposed to be? I was like, well, I guess kind of like a Stan Lee. He goes, why don't you just write it for Stan Lee? I was like, I don't know Stan Lee. He's like, I do. And I was like, Hollywood is good. So suddenly, like, I had an inroad to Stan Lee. I was like, you damn Skippy, I'm going to cast him in the movie. Now, Mallrats comes out and tanks when it comes out. Nobody remembers that. Most people think of, like, Mallrats as like, oh, man, I've had it on video for years. I love that movie as a kid, whatever. But it died at the box office and stuff. Stan never cared. The rest of my life, we were thick as thieves. We were literally friends. I thought he was just always nice to me because I put him in Mallrats. But one day we shot like this Audi commercial around the time that uh, Age of Ultron came out. So he was in this Stan Lee School of Cameo acting commercial, really adorable spot that was, you know, a, a low key commercial for, for an Audi car. But you spent very little time in the car, more uh, the plot of it was Stan was teaching cameo acting to other people and stuff. And so when he left that day, we had a blast shooting it. Um, his man, his body man, his guy who was always there with him, was like, he loves you. And I was like, I love him. Who don't love Stan Lee, man, right? And he goes, no, he loves you. He thinks of you like a son. And that like hit me hard, man, like really, really hard in the heart. He was wonderful. Uh, he's everything you wanted him to be. Um, and both Stan Lee, the character, the greatest character Stan Lee created, of course, was Stan Lee himself. Stan Lee, the character that he portrayed every damn day of his life. And even Stan Lee Lieber, the guy at the heart of Stan Lee, the real guy who I saw a few times over the course of like 25, 26 years of knowing the guy. I got to see the real man underneath and he was just as charming as the guy he created and whatnot. Uh, that was pretty magical. But working with George Carlin as well, this was a guy who was my comedic hero. My father would give me George Carlin albums and be like, do not let your mother hear you listen to this. Plug in the headphones into the hi-fi and that's how you listen to George Carlin. So he trusted me with that. You know, you see in movies and TV shows when a father sits down with a son, cracks a beer, is like, you're old enough to do this. We didn't have that. You know, my, I, I don't like booze and neither did my father that much. So instead, it was comedy. You know, he knew I didn't like sports and stuff. He liked boxing. I didn't like sports. I like the movies. I like TV shows and stuff. I love comics and I love comedy. I love Saturday Night Live. So he started bringing home comedy records from, from his job. He worked at the United States Postal Service. He canceled stamps at night. That was his job. He would work the night shift. So he'd always come home with these comedy albums like Class Clown, like all the Red Fox stuff, um, tons of tons of like really like blue comedy as they called it back in the day, a lot of bad language. And my mother would be mad if she'd find out. She'd be like, you can't let him listen to those albums. If you're going to give him comedy albums, let him listen to a good, clean comedian like Bill Cosby, a decision that my mother regretted <laughs> later in life and stuff. So my father would give me the Carlin albums, and then I would listen to them on The Secret, on the down low. And then one day when we finally got cable TV in our area, my father was like, George Carlin is going to be on HBO telling jokes for an hour. We didn't even have that. We were so primitive. It was in the 80s. We didn't have the language for it. Like, oh, there's a new comedy special because there was no new comedy special. It was the first one of its kind. So I, he trusted me enough to like watch. He's like, we're going to watch it together. Me, you and your mom, my brother and sister, they were out that night and stuff. So we sit down to watch it together. It's Carlin at Carnegie. And my mother goes, I don't know. Are you sure he's old enough for this? And my father goes to my mom, don't worry, Grace, George Carlin is Catholic. And so if you've ever seen Carlin and Carnegie, it begins with George coming up and uh, coming out and on, onto the Carnegie Hall stage and telling a joke that goes something like, you know, have you ever noticed that people against abortion are people you wouldn't want to have sex with in the first place? And of course he doesn't have, have, <laughs> have sex with, he uses much, much better word than that. <laughs> and my mother, you know, my, my mother is horrified. My father is laughing and I'm sitting between them on the floor. And my mom goes, you see, you see, this is not, this is too grown up for the boy. And my dad goes, oh, don't worry. And my mom goes, he's going to have all sorts of questions after watching this. And my father is like, no, he won't. And I turned to my father and I go, dad, what is abortion? And my mom was like, see, and she left the room and stuff. And so I was like, should we stop watching this? And my father goes, no, let's keep watching. And we did. 
And my mom eventually came back, man. She came back when we started talking about Tippy the farting dog. That was more of her speed. And I remembered like very deep impression that night. Nobody was allowed to curse in my house. My mother wouldn't even say the word hell. She would say H-E double hockey sticks. So here was this guy who was allowed to curse in our living room in front of me and my parents without them being like, leave the room. Because my father respected his intelligence. He would always say that. I'd be like, look, those words mean nothing. That's just a way for him to communicate. He's going, but you listen to what he says behind those words. He's smart, he's a smart man. And he's right. George Collins was the smartest man I ever met in this lifetime and stuff. And so when I had a chance to like, work with him, put him in dogma as Cardinal Glick seemed pretty ironic and fun. I leapt at that chance, man. And, and, you know, got to meet him and, and work with him. He was adorable. When um, his wife passed away uh, right before we were about to make dogma and stuff. And so I didn't want to bug him. And I was, uh, we were on an episode of the, the Conan O'Brien show when he used to do the late night version um, together, but I had a script, but his wife had just passed away and I didn't want to bombard him with, Hey man, you want to be in a movie? So I gave it to his manager, Jerry. And then his manager called me like a week later. It was like, George read your script and he would like to meet with you at the Four Seasons of Beverly Hills on Thursday. Can you do that? And I was like, I'll get there and do that. So I'm late for everything, Dan. Never on time for anything in my life. I'm my mother's son. So that means I'm easily 20 minutes late when I leave the house and stuff. I was not late that day. I went to the restaurant an hour in advance, sat there, picked out a, a seat where I could see every entrance, even if he came in from the patio and stuff if George Carlin was coming in and I sat there and waited for a full hour. It was just me and the wait staff. And at noon on the button, he came in, he was timely as hell. He comes into the restaurant and I can't do it justice because I'm not George and I'm not standing, but he walks in, he stops dead. I'm the only person in the restaurant. And he goes like this. <laughs> and then sees me and then comes over and he goes, George Carlin. I was like, Oh, I know who you are. I said, Oh my God. I've been listening to you my whole life, watching you my whole life. My dad, passed me on to you. He goes, I get that a lot. He goes, listen, I want to talk to you about this script. And he had the dogma script. I was like, do you like it? He goes, I liked it very much. He's gone, can't help but think that I was a bit of an influence on it. I said, oh, you were. And he goes, can't help but think in some sections, I deserve co-writing credit. And I was like, absolutely. You're as influential as they come. So he said to me, his wife just passed away. He goes, well, look, I would love to do this, but I wanted to talk to you about this because there's something that weighs heavy. I said, go ahead. So as you know, my wife just passed away. And it was not just his wife, it was his business partner. They built the George Carlin brand together for years. So it was devastating loss for him. So uh, I said, I, I heard, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And he said, well, I'm just not ready to take off my wedding ring yet. And if I'm going to play a cardinal, I know to the church, they don't wear rings unless they're big fat rings that show up opulent wealth, but not marriage. He's going, so we've come to an impasse. He's going, but I think I have a solution. If you'll allow me, as the character of Cardinal Glick, I will put a Band-Aid around my wedding ring. And so it'll just be a side story thing that Cardinal Glick is klutzy or whatever, but I'll be wearing that Band-Aid in the movie if I'm wearing my ring. That way I can wear my ring throughout the movie. If you could deal with that, then I can happily be in this movie. And I was like, "Why well, can you be my father? That's so beautiful. I was like, George, you could wear Band-Aids <laughs> all over your whole body. That's such a beautiful sentiment. He goes, then I'm in. So that's how I got to work with heroes of mine. You just, you got to be willing to, like, it's not about your career. It's not about, like, what's going to get you to the next level. It's, like, what's going to fill your heart and soul. And those two relationships, man, I'm lucky that I had them. Both of those gentlemen passed. And, you know, I went from fan to a dude who was literally friends with them. George Carlin would call my house, bro. Stan Lee came over to my house. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm so happy with the decisions that I made. And it paid dividends in terms of like hype and cool years later. Here we are still talking about that. Imagine if I'd cast like anybody else. But did but you I have to learn involved. that? Did you have to learn that? Or did you come to the game that way? Because that feels like a perspective that has to be learned. I would have imagined from afar, not even knowing that you would have gone a different direction with after chasing Amy and Dogma because you were making uh, such a smart movie. And I, I would have guessed that if I'd asked you, the director, knowing nothing other than your work, uh, hey, do you think you'll be making Clerk 3 in, in 30 years? I would have expected any director from Hollywood to say, well, no, that's not what I'm going to be doing. But it seems like um, you've got a perspective that Hollywood doesn't often have. I don't know how you came upon that happy. I don't know how you learned that. You know, it's what is it? I, I took it from Shakespeare. You know, I'm sure there's some biblical lesson that teaches us this as well, but to thine own self be true. Like at the end of the day, 
we go through this life alone. Yeah, we pair up and we have friends who help us, but like cradle to grave, you it's this is it. This is your one journey through this life. And we don't know what happens after this. We don't know if we get to come back. So as I journey through this life, it was always important to me. I was raised, you know, Catholic, but I think even if I wasn't, I had comic books. So I was never a person that wanted to hurt people. I always wanted to help people, see them smile, make them laugh. And I didn't have ability to do anything real in this world. Couldn't play half the sports, wasn't good working for people, making pretend, making jokes and stuff, put a smile on people's face. So my, my way in was never about like, I want to get rich. It was about self-expression. I just wanted to, I just wanted people to know that I was here. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to write on the big wall like Kev was here. I didn't want to just perish and pass from this universe one day without people knowing that I was here. And so I wanted to, what was it that Lord Byron said? I want to stomp on the Terra and make sure that like I made an impact. I didn't need to dent the universe, but I wanted to sing my song. And so I saw people like Richard Linklater made a movie called Slacker and, and Hal Hartley made Trust. And of course, before them, uh, Scorsese, Spike Lee made She's Gotta Have It. People, indie film was happening in a big, bad way. And I was into it. And I was like, this, this is a possibility. I always thought to be in the movies, you have to come from Hollywood or be born into it. But these kids are making movies in, like, they're not in New York or LA. They're making them in Austin, Texas. Where the hell's that? Like, that, that might as well be New Jersey. So a little ignorance goes a long way. I didn't know that Austin was the capital of Texas. And of course, if you're going to make a movie, it was probably going to be in Austin, Texas. To me, it was just like, that's the middle of nowhere, Texas. If they could make a movie in Texas, why can't I make a movie in New Jersey? So I kind of always went at it differently. And I never expected it to go beyond Clerks. Clerks wasn't even meant to be like, here I am. It was a calling card movie so that I could show it to a future investor so I wouldn't have to pay for the next movie because Clerks went all on credit cards that I had collected. I wasn't a rich kid. I come from a poor family. We weren't allowed to say poor. My mother was always like, you just say that we are lower, lower, lower middle class. And you make sure to make sure to tell people that we never went on food stamps. That was a big point of pride for her. But we were a low, low, low income. We were a poor family. And so at the end of the day, like it, it wasn't like, oh, I got enough money to make a movie. I had credit cards that I accumulated in a race with my friend to see who can get more plastic by lying to credit card companies. And so, you know, I had him sitting there in a drawer and Robert Townsend had made this movie called The Hollywood Shuffle that I absolutely loved. And I remember he gave an interview once on Howard Stern and he talked about how he partly financed the movie on credit cards. And I was like, you could do that sort of thing? I got credit cards. I mean, hmm, maybe one day. So I never went at it going like, this is going to be my career. I just wanted to see if I could do it. You know, it's like in, in sports, like uh, in hockey particularly, there are people that are born to play the game like Wayne Gretzky put on this earth to reinvent the game of hockey. Like, you know, granted his father taught him anticipation, but let's be honest, this kid was touched by the hand of God. Not every player is touched by the hand of God. Doesn't mean they don't get to play. Means a heart player can be just as effective, just as strong, and perhaps just as powerful as true talent, as God-given talent. Because sometimes the dream, the passion to do a thing will take you further than a God-given natural ability to do that same thing. So I was an outsider. I loved watching movies. And then one day seeing Slacker made me think, well, what if you made a movie? Like this guy made a movie and he's no different than you. He was a college kid. Like you didn't even go to college. Like, you know, and you're not going to go to college. So instead of wasting that money going to school, put it into a feature film. And so that's what I did. So going at it that way always meant that I was never going to do the right thing for my career. I was never going to get stupid, crazy rich. But I got rich enough for Kevin Smith, I'll be honest with you. So no complaints there. So I always followed my heart and just like, what do I want to do? What stories do I want to tell? So from the outside, I'm sure people are like, his career is all over the place. He starts with promise, then he goes crazy. And then, then he starts making walrus movies. And so who knows what he's doing nowadays. Uh, but for me, like post heart attack, you know, I kind of returned to the past, went back to the Buick universe, made Jay and Silent Bob reboot and now Clerks 3. And those are just good for the soul. Uh, they're also fun to do. I, like, I love checking back in with those characters. Is You know, when you do episodic television, you get to write for characters that you love for a long time. When you make a feature, you get like two hours, 120 pages, and that's it. And then you're never supposed to touch that character again. Like, so Clerks 2 made sense to me, and then Clerks 3 made sense as well. So I'll probably keep doing that. I don't know that I'll ever do anything 
noteworthy beyond like, you know, whatever I've done already. Thank God I got clerks. I'll be honest with you. Like clerks puts me in the record books for all times. And that took the pressure off very early on. First one out the gate, man, was like made such an impact, such a cultural impact. And this is not me saying this is what I've been told for years. And the movie still works to this day. And there's no denying at this point that it, it made an impact. Having one of those, honestly, like felt like took me off the hook where I was like, well, I'm not, I'm not in this for excellence. I'm in this for the adventure, man. I used to be a destination guy, but then over the course of recording Smodcast podcasts I've been doing for years and years with Scott Mosier, I realized that I was a journey guy. Like, you know, just go on the journey, man. See where it leads. And that's how you wind up in things like Red State or Tusk or Yoga Hosers and stuff. Like weird movies that a lot of people don't like. But for me, I'm like, now we're finally talking. Like, I love all my work. Don't get me wrong, particularly the early stuff. But I never had an experimental film period, man. I hit the ground running with clerks and then suddenly educated myself in front of everybody while making movies. So by the time I get to Red State and Tusk and Yoga Hosers, that's me going like, this, this is what I would have done if I had to cut my teeth to get into the industry. Like low budget stuff, rubber monster movies, rubber mask monster movies that I kind of grew up on. So even though a lot of people like hate those movies that I've made recently, I love them to death. Like they're my favorite of the bunch in many ways because I'm like, this is me being experimental. This is me playing like the kid I never really got to be because right away people are like, you're an important voice of a generation, say some things. And I was like, uh, all right, uh, mall rats. And like that. So I was like, all right, uh, chasing Amy. And they liked that very much. And then I was like, uh, dogma. And they liked that very much. But dogma came with a lot of pressure, a lot of right-wing folks and religious folks uh, threatened my life and my, and my, my, kid's life, my wife's life, and all my friends' lives and stuff. And a funny thing went to very serious very, very quickly. So after that, I was like, look, I just want to make a movie after this where nobody gets mad at me. Nobody pulls out a statue of Mary and rubs it in my face and says a rosary at me because I'm going to hell because they think my movie is, is the pathway to, to the devil. I just want to make something fun. And so I made Jane, Silent Bob, Strike Back. And that movie is so drastically different from Clerks, Mallrats, Chasing Amy, and Dogma, because those movies, Clerks, Mallrats, Chasing Amy, and Dogma, that's my entire life laid out across four movies. Everything I learned and loved and was passionate about, like that was all in me when I was able to start my career as a filmmaker. And then by the time I get to Dogma, like I, I was like, here, this is, this is the ballsiest thing I'll ever say, plow, and put it out there. And then, you know, there was a threat of violence. So at that point, I was like, well, I don't want to say anything important because that gets one in trouble. So let me just say something that won't offend anybody. Let me just have a good time. Let me, you know, we we made four movies. It was kind of a celebration, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, kind of like unfair, maybe early. I know like a lot of people when they saw the movie back in the day, they were like, this is like a YouTube fan film made by a fan. And it was, I was a big fan of my movies. And that's what Jay and Silent <laughs> Bob Strike Back is. It's like me going, we made four movies. Let's talk about all of them in the fifth one. So I don't know if it counts so much as like a movie. And that is kind of where critics start separating from me, where they're like, oh, this is what he's going to do after Dogma. It had the effect of like uh, when the Coen brothers did Fargo and won Oscars and stuff like that. And everybody was like, oh, my God, the guys who were always outside, now they're inside, man. They're going to keep making these brilliant movies like Fargo. What's next? And the next movie was Big Lebowski. And everybody was like, oh. And it took a minute and the audience found Lebowski, but a bunch of people were like this, like this is what you're gonna do after Fargo. I got a bunch of that when I made Jane Silent Bob Strike Back. They're like, this is what you're gonna do. It's after funny Fargo. because I'm guessing that you get hit all the time with some form of either coward or sellout. And you're like, nah, I'm gonna choose happy. I'm gonna go ahead and just choose happy and go fuck yourself. Oh, let me tell you something, sellout, like, you know, there's a way to get rich in this business. And I did not choose that path. When you're making Kevin Smith movies, you can't possibly sell out because you're constantly undersold. You're selling to a, a market that dwindles every day. Um, so yeah, no, sellout never felt applicable. Coward could definitely feel applicable. You got to remember there were death threats on Dogma. And you know, uh, Martin Scorsese got death threats on Last Temptation of Christ. I don't see him making another Jesus picture anytime soon. You know what I'm saying? Like a death threat will change your perspective. And there were times where I was like, I would love to do Dogma too, but probably, you know, if you do Dogma too, you can't just like limit it to the Catholic church anymore. I shot my wad 
on, on the Catholic church. I mean, not literally, that sounds gross, but like in terms of speaking about the Catholic church, because I grew up Catholic, was an altar boy for like 12 years and stuff. And I said everything I wanted to say about Catholicism and dogma. If I was ever to make another religious movie, you would have to have to talk about other religions. Um, and that would include Islam. And of course that seems not like a really good idea uh, if, if talk to Salman Rushdie. So yeah, you can hang coward on me, but I don't know where I ever told anybody I was brave in the first place. Like, you know, the movies, people could take them for brave, but it's like, why is it brave? It's all make pretend. Even Chasing Amy and Dogma, they're just make pretend stories. It's not brave. Brave is a person that's like, you know, I'm putting on a flak jacket and I'm heading into war on behalf of our nation. Or, or you know, the guy who's like, I'm pulling on a cow and I'm beating up the penguin for Gotham City. And he's a fictional character. But that's brave to me. Making a movie was never brave. They gave me an award once. Uh, the People for the American Way. Wonderful organization that Norman Lear uh, has a lot to do with. And the award was for the Defender of Democracy. And they gave it to me for dogma. And when I got up to speak, I was like, you know, I appreciate this because I love getting awards, but Defender of Democracy? I was like, there's some poor kid out in the Middle East right now, some poor American kid getting shot at who's going, Silent Bob's defending democracy by making a movie? I don't think so. I, I, so, chose, you know, I, I chose my I, word wrong. I chose my word wrong when I just think of how critics must receive you. I think with Dogma and Chasing Amy, there was probably an expectation for what they wanted you to make as your smartest and the best of your ability. And you're like, I just want to have fun with my friends and and do the make-believe thing. I don't want to have to keep going stronger and, and smarter if it's going to get me death threats. But yeah, there's that. And there's also like, I, I get this and I'm, I'm like happy to accept this responsibility, but for a generation of kids, not, not anymore, but for a generation of people, I was an avatar of sorts. Um, and as much as I had a very relatable uh, entry into the business, I, I did not, it wasn't like I was born into it. My parents did this or whatever. Like I was a guy who worked at a convenience store. I had a McJob like most people. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to turn a camera on this McJob. And it panned out. It was like me buying a lottery ticket on myself that really panned out. So the relatability to that, you know, Clerks is a movie that launched a thousand ships because people were like, I sit around and talk to my friends about movies. I think I could make a movie too. And they're absolutely right and stuff. But naturally, everyone had varying results. Not everybody got as lucky as I did in terms of the exposure that I was given from Miramax, which had just been bought by Disney. So they had tons of movie money and tons of of something to prove because they had just been bought by Disney's people like, Oh, this art house company is going to sell out. So what did they do? They were like, we'll buy the dirtiest, grungiest, most American movie we can get our hands on at Sundance. And that was clerks. So I benefited from that. That's kind of where clerks clerks comes from. Otherwise people might not have seen that movie. So, you know, going into it, like people, once that happens, a whole audience, and that includes the critics, you're their avatar. You know, and they're, you, when they interview you or when people read interviews with you, you're incredibly relatable um, because you are part of the audience. Up till 10 seconds ago, you were also a member of the audience. What happens, Dan, the, the only problem I've noticed over the last, I've been doing this like 27, 28 years now, is when people's expectations of who you are and what you should be doing differentiate from who you really are and what you want to do with your one and only life and career. So I've, I've had it from both critics who are like, why would he do that? Like, that's so stupid. He was on a roll and now this. And I've also had it from audiences who are like, why would you do that? You shouldn't have made that movie. Like, why? You know, like, Jer the audience uh, that I normally had on Jersey Girl on, on my career got mad at me for Jersey Girl. Um, and the critics did as well. And I thought the critics would actually like that. That was one of those movies where I was like, well, the audience, the, Meyer, the Jay and Silent Bob kids may not like it, but the critics will. And that didn't happen in either direction and stuff. So, yeah, there's, there's always kind of an element of you letting people down simply by being you. I remember there was a line in, you know, The Dark Knight that I, when the movie came out, I even think I talked about or tweeted about the line that Harvey Dent talked about where he's just like, you either die a hero or live long enough to become a villain. And I was like, I don't believe that. I don't think that's true and stuff. And the internet was like, no, on a long enough scale, blah, blah, blah. And it's true. You stick around long enough. I've gone through every iteration, man. I've been villainized. I've been dubbed a hero. I've been dubbed, uh, you know, the, the Methuselah, the man on the mountain who's been way into this stuff for a long, long time. Uh, I've been dubbed the He-Man killer 
So, you know, it's, it takes you in weird directions the longer you stick around in, in this career. This career is not meant for longevity. People like to be entertained by new and fresh things. And I'm not new and I'm not fresh. I just keep telling Kevin Smith stories. So I'm lucky I got the real estate I got in this business. And to be fair, like, I love every Marvel movie. Love them to death. I, I'm not the guy to make them. Uh, but, I, man, I love them to death and stuff. For me, it's like I get one life. Do I want to try to make somebody else's movie before the heart attack? Yeah, I made Cop Out. And I went through that experience. I was like, all right. I, wrote, I directed somebody else's script. Now I know what that's like and stuff. But now, post-heart attack, all I want to do until the day that the heart wins, because, like, the heart ain't done. I got bad genetics. I change. I went vegan, dropped, like, 80 pounds. Don't matter. At the end of the day, I'm subjected to the genetics I have. And my dad died of a heart attack when he was 67. And my mom's got three stents in her heart. So I got a weak ticker and big hips, thanks to my mom. I tell her that all the time. I say, you give me a weak heart and your childbearing hips, mother. So in that world where, like, who knows how much time I got, do I really want to prove my mettle by doing, I don't know, classier, fair Oscar movies? Somebody else's Super movies. Somebody else's ideas for what your movie should be. Like, that's I one life. I got I to gotta, I gotta say what I got to say. And there's so much to say, as you can hear, Dan. Were you surprised? It sounds like you were totally naive about what the reaction to dogma would be. I mean, you were, you were being sacrilegious. I didn't think so. As a Catholic, I thought that movie was incredibly devout. I mean, especially you go watch it today. It's like people were mad at this. There was a rubber poop monster in it. Like that, that movie does not crap on faith. If you watch Dogma, that movie extols the virtue of faith and believes in everything it says. That's what George Carlin said when we were making the movie. He goes, one day we were sitting around set. He goes, you really believe all this stuff, don't you? And I was like, yeah, you don't. And he goes, no, I'm smarter than that. So, you know, George thought he was getting into something sacrilegious, but I was like, it's actually kind of devout. Like, I, he thought I was being ironic, but I was like, no. Up until like a minute ago, I believed in all but this. But how Christian confusing thought. must that reaction, if you think you're making a funny homage to faith and it results in death threats, um, you how did you misread that so poorly? Um, people don't have a great sense of humor when it comes to their faith. I, I learned that lesson pretty quick. I was raised on Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And even though I'm Catholic, I found it hilarious and whatnot. Didn't dent my faith one iota. Didn't move me off my position. I wasn't like, you know, these British guys turned my head. Like I still went to church. I was still an altar boy, still received Eucharist and stuff. So, you know, I know that like you can watch a movie and not have it destroy your faith, but apparently the Catholic League and, uh, and there, there's another group, I think they were called the, the organization for the tradition of family property or something. It was very weird, very, very conservative right wing kind of thing. So those cats seem to think that an entire nation would be somehow threatened by this movie with a rubber poop monster in it. But if you want, if they ever took the time to see it, because again, they got, they attacked it without seeing it. They would have been like, Oh, this is actually a commercial for faith. Like ever since dogma for years, I hear from at least one priest a year. I, I promise you who tells me like, I use this movie to connect to youth, man. He's going like, it's it's one of the finest tools I've ever had in my arsenal for bringing people into the discussion. Like, so I, you know, I, I'm happy about that. More happy that I got to make the movie at all, man. I got to express my faith. And those were the last embers of my, of my then dying faith. I carried my faith until I was about 28 years old, man, 29. And then dogma is my last expression of that faith, my last gasp. So anybody who saw the sacrilegious movie didn't really see the movie. At all. You you regard that as your smartest film, do you not? Like if when you just look at at what's the piece of work that I did that uh, had a degree of difficulty, was challenging, and this represents because I think I think where you're burdened by the expectations of critics is right there. Oh wait a minute, this guy's going to go into this fire and he's going to play around on this rail, and you've seen how it, how hard it can be to do comedy now, right? Like you were. You were you were purposely. No, I, I, I disagree with that, though. In terms of like, it's hard to do comedy now. I can still make dogma today. No, no problem. Why? I mean, it's not like I'm going after the Middle East or something like that. That's a hot button topic. Going after the Catholic Church then, as now. In fact, now if I went after the Catholic Church, I'd have even way more support. They'd be like, "Oh yeah, you know them with the kids." Back then, they kept that all very very quiet. So at the end of the day, like I, you know, I, I don't know, like I. 
I don't know if I consider that my smartest work. I don't think any of the work is real smart, Dan. They're all made up goofy ass stories. If they make you feel something, then I did my job. If they make you feel, you know, powerful about life, if they make you feel empowered, if they make you feel passionate about something, um, if they make you feel okay about something that other people tell you is wrong, then I've done my job. But like smart, you know, like I, I've always tried to undercut everything I do with very dumb, dopey humor and stuff because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm. You'll get no intelligence lessons here. Now, in terms of clever, like what do I think? I'm, I think I'm very clever. Um, uh, that's it. I don't think I'm talented or smart. I think I'm clever, like Bugs Bunny. I figured out some good angles and I've kept a thing going for a long time. That's about it. So in terms of the movies I've made, what I think is the most clever is probably Tusk because that movie shouldn't work by any stretch of the imagination. It's dumb as hell. Um, it's a movie that it, it's illogical, but it treats its subject matter so seriously. And I collected an insanely wonderful cast that played it so straight, played it like it was Argo for heaven's sakes. And it works, it holds together. Like it's, it is a, a, a I'm gonna curse, so get ready for the cut, that shit crazy movie that should never work, but it does show that the guy behind it, the director, if you will, had learned something over the course of his almost 20 year career at that point. Like he learned how to tell a, 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 an unnerving story. It's one thing to make people laugh. It's another thing to unnerve them, unsettle them. And then to do it with the weird, you know, story that you came up with a podcast based on reading an ad in the want ads of a British uh, website called gumtree.uk. All of it should not have worked. But that was me at my absolute most confident going like, oh no, I think there are enough elements here to make this come together. And we found money for it and made it happen. And Johnny Depp was in it. And I got to work with Michael Parks, like one of my favorite actors on the planet, like, you know, who I'd worked with on Red State prior. All of it was to me, I was like, man, I remember sitting on the set of Tusk when, you know, uh, Kretschmer, who's our production designer, built the walrus enclave where Justin Long would put on the suit and swim around in that pool and stuff like that as a prisoner of, of this madman, Michael Parks. I was like, my mother's right. I am so clever. That's it. That's all I got going for me is clever. And one day clever runs out, but until, until that happens, I'll, I'll keep running on clever. But I, you know, I, it's, I don't feel burdened by the expectation of critics because that was a long time ago. Critics have long since given up any hope in me and stuff. Everyone's, I think now it's easier to surprise critics because they've been given up on me for so long. Like even I got good reviews on, on Tusk. It was kind of crazy, man. Like when we first played at, at uh, the Toronto International Film Festival, we had our midnight screening. Like I remember the New York Times, like in spite of itself was like, look, <laughs> kind of the best movie made in years. Reluctantly, like, you know, reluctantly. <laughs> Re very, very much so. Like, I'll take that more than a wild rave where it's just like, they're like, against the better nature of our intelligence, we're going to say that he actually pulled it off. I've got a million questions, so I hope we can, uh, I hope another time we can get to, I wanted to ask you, like, just the difficulties of making a movie on $27,000 and how scared you had to have been. But next time, Street Stash, tell me why it is that you decided to do this book. No, if you want to answer that question, I've got a million more. We'll have I'll, Please I'll answer both, that Dan. question. I'm, okay. I'm a pro, so I'll be able to do both. This is the book, Kevin Smith's Secret Stash, put out by Inside Editions. It is full of all the stuff that me and Dan have been talking about, plus like pictures and graphics and stuff. It is the accumulation of my entire career. It's a coffee table book, uh, thick as uh, normally I say a word that rhymes with thick, but you know, obviously uh, we'll keep it clean. Uh, if you drop this, not even from like the top of the Empire State Building, but like a second floor, you would kill a person. This book's so damn heavy and stuff. So in that book, which is available right now at Amazon, please go buy it. Um, in that book, I talk about making clerks. And in terms of, Making the $27,000 movie, Dan, utter freedom. Like, it's all on you. Like, even though I was like, man, I'm responsible for this money, there was no note, no whatsoever. There's nobody out there saying, this is how you should tell your story when you know as the filmmaker exactly how you should tell your story. Now, that doesn't mean you're not open to suggestion or collaboration. Film is collaboration. It's not a one-person gig, man. All those people make the film. That's why I don't take that a film by credit sort of thing. But at the end of the day, you got to answer the questions and it's in your head. They're trying to pull that movie out and stuff. So 
at $27,000, way less pressure. The only pressure was on me. I was like, I'm going to have to pay this money back one day. But I was like, well, I could always get a second job. You know, there, there was a logic kind of behind it. And in terms of fear, it wasn't until the movie got bought and we were clear, we were on our way to making dogma that I looked back and was like, that could have gone so wrong. Like, where did I get the chutzpah to try that? I was not that person in life. But Richard Linklater's movie Slacker just made it seem so possible to me. I was like, this kid in Austin, Texas took his shot and now he's a filmmaker. He made days to confuse for heaven's sakes. I want to take my shot. I want to sing my song. At the very least, I'll have a document of what my life looked at, at the time. I'll have a movie to show for it. And if I'd waited 10 minutes, YouTube was about to happen and it would have been unquestionable. I would have definitely made something a quick stop. But thank God I still did it at a time when people were impressed by that sort of thing. Now there are billions of me all over the place. Normal creators who just come out of uh, the real world, you know, not born on Mount Olympus or, or given uh, a career. People who do it based on saying something original. So I, I'm, I'm not part of the YouTube generation. I preceded it by a damn minute, but I identify with them more than I identify with my fellow filmmakers. You know, they're gifted and talented. I'm like the YouTube kids. I'm hard, hard scrabble and trying to figure it out. And those YouTube kids that are gifted and talented, they'll rise far above me and whatnot. So I, yeah, I, it was, it was never scary. Like it just seemed logical. I was like, in order to get to where I want to be in life, I have to make this movie. And um, it wasn't until the movie got bought that I was like, I, I could have been so broke. Like, oh my God, I could still be living at my parents. But that was the key, Dan. I didn't mind living with my parents. I would have stayed in Jersey until I was like 100 years old. So there was no downside. You know, even if I failed, it was like, well, I just got to pay it back. But at least I got a movie to show for it. And I would have watched that movie with my friends once a year to be like, look at me when I made the worst decision of my life. Uh, I do watch it once a year now to be like, look at me, look at that kid who put us where we are and made the best decision of our lives. I love that kid. It is such a cool, creative story. Next time, the heart attack and love and life perspective. Uh, next time. I really enjoyed that. Thank you for making the time, Kevin. Thank you for having me. I'll come back whenever you need me. I sit around, smoke weed most mornings. I'm so free. Okay, let's do that. I want to do it again. I do. I can ask you questions for days. Done and done. Man, that was so much fun. What a great way to wake up. Uh, thank you so much.